Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum Pakistan. This is Heather Mehdi and thank you very much for watching my program. Thanks to all my subscribers for your comments, your criticism, your praise and especially a great thanks to my patrons. Today's program is in English as I have one of the most eminent uh, commentators and experts and insightful people on the Middle East and therefore the introduction. Uh, I start with this prayer uh, to the Almighty to please expand my breast to make my task easier to unlock the my my tongue so that people can understand me my guest today is none other than the most eminent the most well respected journalist investigative journalist and uh, syndicated columnist and someone who everyone said got it right about the americans in iraq mr eric margolis mr margolis welcome to the program sir thank you it's great to be back with you again Thank you very much. It was a pleasure meeting you the other night. Thank you so much for being with us. Good to see you, sir. So we're going to be talking, of course, about the Hamas-Israeli uh, conflict that uh, commenced a couple of days ago. Um, there are a couple of things that I wanted to put uh, as context. One is Joe Biden's speech in which he talks about the butchery, the slaughter. You know, he talks about uh, terrorism. He talks about uh, genocide. He talks about anger, pain, hopelessness, human tragedies. I thought he was talking about the Palestinians, what they've been going through, but apparently he was talking about the Israelis. So that's one. And he came out, didn't answer any questions, walked away. You know, when the question, the other really is what went wrong? Why didn't the Israelis were able to anticipate this? And I think that's the second part I want to address with you. And the third part is, uh, you know, why did this happen? Why is this happening over and over again? And finally, really, uh, what's the solution? Where do you go from here? So over to Biden, Mr. Joe Biden and, and him. What do you make of his speech? Well, I think it was borderline hysterical. <laughs> uh, the I, part of it that I heard was uh, shockingly unpresidential, unpres uh, but one could feel that U.S. elections are getting close because obviously he was uh, appealing to the Jewish and to the uh, conservative, very right-wing Republican conservative voters, uh, and. Uh, he was very forceful in what he said is it's another sign that this administration has been taken over by the neoconservatives and they're using it as a tool. And uh, when you say they've been taken over by the neoconservatives and the tool, the rhetoric that that Biden said in his speech as actually, actually right, shockingly unpresidential. I mean, he wasn't talking about we need to put a stop to this. We need to get all the parties to sit together and meet it. He says, we will send more weapons. We will send interceptors. The word he used was we will send more ammunition. We will fund all the requirements of Israel. And we will make sure that there is swift, decisive, overwhelming response to this is that what a U.S. president needs to say to the world? Well, no, but he wants to say it before U.S. elections because most of the American media is treating this event as an attack on the United States, never mind on Israel. And uh, it's become, as I said, a hysterical question. There's not much rational thought going, it'll calm down. It always happens when these terrible atrocities occur in the Middle East. But uh, the the point is that the, the, the Democrats, uh, the, the Democrats are running scared now. Uh, they're they're going to lose the presidency that, that Biden is too old or he will not live until the elections. Uh, mm. There's great concern in the, in the Democratic Party. And uh, the war wing of the Democratic Party. Uh, there's a left and there's a right wing Democrats. The war wing, uh, which has been beating the war drums for to increase military operations in Ukraine, uh, is now on the Israeli bandwagon as well. And mm. we will see the U.S. I don't know if we are going to enter the war directly, but we see the U.S flying over arms and munitions and weapons and uh, everything they can do to support the Israelis. Mm. 
And and clearly, like you said, the defense industry is probably is dancing with joy at the moment that they have another war theater which can feed them the billions of dollars they earn by killing people. Well, that's an interesting comment because I was talking with my associates this morning, uh, and I'm trying to see which arms industry is going to benefit mm -hmm. from this, and it's very hard to say mm -hmm. because. The only thing the Israelis will run short of are uh, bombs and uh, ammunition, artillery shells. Uh, the rest, they have plenty of. In fact, the U.S. Israel uh, got the U.S. to set, set, set up two huge arms stores inside Israel of American weapons that were used in a crisis. And so the Israelis already have tons of arms. Uh, they don't need tanks and jet fighters to, to attack the wretched Palestinians who have nothing but a few M16 rifles and homemade rockets. Uh, so it's, it's not a big boon for the defense industry, unless, of course, this war spreads and other people get involved. Which is which is a possibility because uh, you know someone said that uh, Biden said any country taking advantage of the situation, I am telling them don't. And obviously there was Iran written on both of his eyes. But it's very interesting you say about the ammunition. You know the Pakistan ordnance factories under contract with the Pakistan army have supplied close to a billion dollars worth of ammunition and artillery cells to the Ukrainian military. There is a growing concern amongst the senior military officials, and, I, and I'm quoting from senior military generals in the Pakistan army who have actually spoken to me and who have said, we're greatly concerned that our weapons, artillery shells and ammunition will find its way into Israel. Yes, that's right. And uh, it's uh, Israel is getting a, a very substantial amount of arms and munitions from different countries. And, uh, but the, uh, the Israelis are very well positioned now. And if they need more stuff, the Americans will fly it in as it did during the Nixon days and the 73 war. Hmm. Yes, the famous air bridge, as it was called at that time. So, uh, so moving on from Biden to, uh, to a military perspective and uh, I, I was listening to a certain uh, Colonel Cedric Layton on CNN, and he said that this was a classic failure of technology. Hamas completely blindsided uh, uh, Israel and its massive technological superiority by just going back to basics, which is face-to-face -face meetings. Um, what's your take on that? And is Hamas, an uh, associated question, is Hamas prepared for the ground invasion that is likely to follow? I uh, think I, I, President Putin in Russia ordered his people to stop using computers and start go back to the typewriter. Hmm. And very smart man, uh, because all these electronic consistencies can be systems can be broken into or spoofed or confused or jammed. Uh, you can't trust anything anymore. And it's a good lesson. We should be more cautious. Human to human, still the best contact. We become crazed with, uh, with technology. We need less technology, more human brains. And, and, and you're right, because the, I mean, um, the Mossad chief says now, whether he said it for some other reason, a tell you what if one doesn't know, but he said it was a complete surprise. There was no warning. We were taken totally by surprise. And he says a thousand Hamas fighters were involved, but numbers are much higher because 1,500 of them have been declared, uh, you know, dead within within uh, Israel. Uh, there are about 500 in Gaza. So uh, the infiltration was completely unexpected. So where do you think Hamas got all this weaponry from, this uh, 5,000 rockets that they fired. Uh, is there something that we need to learn from this? No, there. it's homemade stuff. They're like yes. pipe bombs that criminals mm. use. Uh, they're very, very primitive weapons. And they're very, they're largely ineffective, too. Uh, if we look at all 4,000 rockets fired in Israel 
and I, I may have knocked down one or two palm trees, mm -hmm. but uh, that's that's about it. Uh, the uh, the uh, Arabs have no offensive capability unless it's the regular Arab armies. But the Arab armies are being employed to keep repress Arab militants who want to change their governments. So there, people, ordinary people take it on themselves to fight with the homemade weapons. And that's why I keep calling it a large prison riot. A large prison riot. A large prison riot because the prisoners are the uh, nearly million Palestinians in this hellhole of Gaza. I've been going there for years and it's terrible. It's one of the worst places, maybe the worst on earth. Uh, these, not only that, the Israelis have been restricting water, electricity, medicines, and food to these poor people in there for years now. They're keeping them on near concentration camp starvation wage uh, calorie intake in a terrible situation so the people are desperate and 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 you're right which which brings me to the, the to the next portion about about the conditions in in Gaza but just to confirm your point the colonel of the of the US army did say he said they are mostly indigenous developed themselves the way they were able to counter the iron dome was that the iron dome's effectiveness is 70 to 80 percent they've Fired five thousand and a thousand reached, uh, you know, their target. So they were able to inflict that kind of damage. But that's very interesting. But there is a strong voice emerging that they're trying to now turn their eyes towards Iran or Hezbollah and saying, "Oh, it was Iran who was doing that, so yes. they're going to target." Yeah, this has been going on for a long time. The the war party in the United States, the pro-Israel war party has been beating this war drum for a long time, that it's all the wicked Iranians and they're behind it. And it caused this, let's find Iranians to blame for these attacks. Well, I'm sure the Iranians applauded these attacks and supported them orally, but whether that it did anything more than that, I would be very surprised. The Iranians are too clever to kick sand in Israel's face. Oh, absolutely. Oh, 100%. And, uh, you know, I don't think there's going to be any uh, smoking gun found in their hands, even if there was one. But uh, going on to this this uh, largest open air prison in the world, which houses 2.2 million people, Israel has now stopped in power, water, gas, food, medical supplies. Uh, they have attacked Gaza formally, they're saying, more than 13 times in the last several years. And uh, as one uh, commentator said, it was insane and not uh, to expect a retaliation from the people in Gaza. So if everyone, anyone is saying, I was surprised they're the most stupid people on earth because they should have expected this type of thing to where, what role do you see the international community playing in bringing this to an end? Well, all wars, you know, this is not really a war. All conflicts like this eventually peter out. They run out of weapons. They run out of people, blood plasma, things. The water in this case. Israel is, 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 is doing a major crime according to international law. But by cutting the caloric intake and the water intake of the Palestinians and preventing medicines from coming in, let's not just blame Israel, too, who's also behind this, are the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. uh, Egypt, which runs the most nasty dict dictatorship in the Middle East, in my view, uh, is uh, definitely for blaming. It holds the other key in Gaza to locking up the Palestinians. And the Palestinians, and it's terrified, Egypt is terrified of the Palestinians because they are advocating some democracy, free speech, uh, free elections of the Palestinians, all the things that the US backed uh, Egyptians and Saudis for that matter don't want. Mm. 
<laughs> you know, Eric, the uh, Rafa border has been closed by the Egyptians, so now the Gazans are completely locked in. Let me share some statistics for me that are coming mm -hmm. in now. Uh, we've had about more than 2,200 mm -hmm. uh, Hamas fighters killed, 140 mm -hmm. children and women killed, mm -hmm. 16 years of blockade, 187,000 people displaced. Uh, um, the, sorry, the number of children dead are 400 women and children. There is slow starvation and slow genocide that's uh, apparently taking place. The noose around Gaza is tightening. The United Nations Secretary General said this is a crime. It's illegal. Condemns the siege of, uh, of uh, Gaza. So with all this happening from the UN side and the rhetoric from the United uh, States and Israel's attack, uh, they say they may launch a ground invasion. The military strategists say they will have limited success. They shouldn't doing it. The uh, Hamas has 150, some say close to 300 hostages. How will this come to an end? Where is where do we start? It, this is very difficult. Uh, the reason the Palestinians had taken all these hostages, which is a crime under international law, uh, is the fact that is to protect them against bombing. The Israelis have bombed them like fish in a bowl, and uh, they've killed tens of thousands of Palestinians this way and destroyed much of the buildings of, of, of Gaza. Uh, this will happen again. The Israelis will come down and pound the hell out of Gaza, starting probably right now. And uh, the this is the usual Israeli response. It's a usual American response to things. Uh, it will continue, probably get worse. Do you do you see any hope of the international community bringing sanity to the U.S. or Israel and bring them onto the table, start negotiations, do something that will stop this genocide of the Palestinians that's been going on for 75 years? I don't think the international powers have the strength or the influence with Washington or the willpower to do this. Uh, the Palestinians are a nuisance to everybody. I, as I've written in the past, sand in the eye of the Middle East. Uh, right. The poor Palestinians. I've been covering this, this for, for over 70 years. Uh, we're aware of it. it uh, it's been part of my life as well. Um, I've written books on this. Uh, but. Everything we've done is of no use so far because the Israelis are determined. To, they'll keep the Palestinians locked up. Their only other option, option is to drive them into the desert or into the sea. They have nowhere to go, these people. Uh, you know, yes, 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 Eric, please continue. No, it's... Uh, I, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. So it's my my apologies. So you know, it's really interesting. You say drive them into the sea or into the desert. Golda Meir and Biden said that in his speech. Interestingly, at the end, he said, "When I met Golda Meir just before the Yom Kippur first war, he says Golda Meir talked to me. Says uh, Senator, uh, do you want a photograph with me? And you know, something happened. And she said, "Do you know our secret? Do you know our secret weapon?" And he said, "What?" He said, "She said." We have nowhere to go. They are creating the exact same circumstances for the Palestinians to then just do everything that is within their sure. rights, legal or illegal. Yeah. The Israelis do have somewhere to go. A million of the current inhabitants of Israel come from Russia. Mm. They're Jewish Russians. And uh, they came here after the collapse of the Soviet Union in a move engineered by the Israel lobby in the United States, paid for by American taxpayers. It's a million, million people in Israel uh, who just slid in while uh, nobody was watching. Then the, uh, the other problem is the Israelis are not going anywhere. Uh, they're not going to move to the States or back to Poland or Russia. Uh, it's inconceivable. So they're going to stay there and fight and, and dig in. And you have the most fanatical Israelis who are there, these settlers, I've met some of them. Uh, they are really very close to the National Socialist Party of Germany. So mm -hmm. uh, racist. So uh, 
that's not going to help. The Israelis are just going to keep bombing and bombing in hopes that the Palestinians will one day decide to leave, just to get the hell out of there and move somewhere else. I don't know, Indonesia or South Africa or something like that. Hmm. But uh, the problem will not go away anytime soon. Hmm. So, uh, you know, it's, it's really interesting you talked about the National Socialist Party, the Nazi Party, because uh, one of the commentators said that the rhetoric that is coming out of the Israel media and the Israel commentators and Israeli servants, is uh, Israeli government officials, is that Palestinians are animals, Palestinians are savages. He says that was the kind of language Nazis used against the Jews. And... Uh, it someone likened Gaza to the Warsaw Ghetto, and I said I shared pictures of the Warsaw Ghetto in black and white, and converted the Palestinian pictures into black and white. And I said which one is Warsaw and which one is Palestine, and people couldn't differentiate between the two. Well, uh, there are unfortunately similarities, but there are also many differences as well. Uh, the uh, Israelis. Uh, the extreme right wing in Israel is, organ is advocating ethnic cleansing, wow. such as we saw in Bosnia or in the Warsaw Ghetto. And the, the, the left wing in Israel is not, is against this, sport, supports many of the peace parties and programs. But unfortunately, there's one, th one thing comes out of this whole horror show, and that is that the Palestinians must have their own independent state uh, to govern their, they can mismanage their own affairs as they, every per, every people has a right to mismanage their own affairs. And this is the case with the Palestinians. Um, they will uh, need a, an independent state. Uh, this has been going on for 75 years. Um, I remember my mother was in the Middle East writing about this 75 years ago, warning that the Arab world was going to blow up if the U.S. didn't do something about millions of homeless refugees. Well, now we have 5 million or more homeless refugees, and now this latest horror in Gaza, which just shows us that we can't keep doing more of the same, even though the Israelis want to. Hmm. So, so in summary, uh, <clears throat> Eric, are you saying that unless there is an independent Palestinian state which has contiguous borders, one whole geographical entity, and they're allowed to run this country, good or bad, whatever, we do not see an end to this genocide that's taking place against the Palestinians? That is correct. Either kill all the Palestinians and grind them up into fertilizer, bury their bodies in the desert, uh, or else find a political solution. Because after all the killing that's been going on these last four days, uh, there's, there's going to be little desire for peace in the Palestinians. And the first thing the Palestinians should do is get rid of their puppet president, Mahmoud Abbas, who is a stooge of the Israelis, and probably senile now and should be kicked out. Thank you very much, Eric. Are there any last words or we can bring this to an end for now and, and uh, we'll reach out to you uh, soon, later next week? Stay calm. Pray that good sense prevails. And uh, let's hope that the Palestinians and the Israelis can settle this thing without massive bombing that it looks like it's going to happen. Thank you very much, Mr. Margolis. Gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, you heard Mr. Margolis. Absolutely, as what you see is what you get, the most candid analysis and interpretation of the event today. Thank you, sir, for You're joining welcome. us again today. May God bless you, keep you in good health. May God bless Pakistan. May God bless the Palestinians. May God bless every other human being who works towards the path of righteousness. And those who have lost their lives, uh, may their souls live for in peace eternally in the heavens. Uh, wish, inshallah, we wish and pray for peace in the world. Thank you. Salaam alaikum. Salaam alaikum, dear Pakistani friends. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.